would really encourage everybody just a five minute break, and even if you just want to stand and stretch in your seats, because I'm cognizant of the fact that time is of the essence now, so just a quick five minute break, and then we're going to start our discussion. Thank you. <laughs> smartened up, but apparently white students are being asked to get up, stand in the left side of the room, and the people of color, and then white students are being forced to apologize to people of color. Yes. And draw flowers, and in each flower say white, male, straight, and how you're an oppressor. Now, they did that when I was in university, which was the 90s, um, but now a few people have just approached me and told me how unhappy they are, how they have to leave the profession, and the amount of abuse they take <clears throat> in class on a regular basis. So I think that's very telling and that's something we all should be worried about. Okay, so we're gonna do about a 50 minute, 45, 50 minute uh, panel discussion, then we're gonna open it to Q&A, and uh, then at the end, um, the professors are available for book signings and pictures. So we're gonna start now. Thanks for your patience again. So I'd like, can everybody hear me at the back, by the way? Okay. I'm going to start with you, Dr. Peterson. There is an argument that free speech should not include offensive and hate speech, and that by um, targeting already stigmatized communities, we are part of the problem and not the solution. And so your detractors have accused you of being mean and insensitive and offensive. So what do you, how do you respond to that? Well, the, the first thing I would say is that we should make no mistake about the fact that some kinds of speech are um, reprehensible. I would put Holocaust denial in that category. So the argument isn't about whether or not some forms of speech are reprehensible. Obviously, that's the case. The question is much more who polices that and why can you trust those who would police it? There's two dangers here, right? There's never any no, no danger route. And our society has learned through extraordinarily painful experience, through the shedding of blood, that freedom of speech is the, is the, solves far more problems than it causes. And that's about as good as we can do. So that's, what I would say about that. With regards to the accusations about being mean, my colleagues have sort of tentatively supported me, some of them. They said, well, you could have been nicer about it. And I have two responses to that. One is, I don't believe that nice is the cardinal virtue. I think it's often a mask for cowardice and harmlessness, neither of which I consider virtues. Um, and the other response is, hey, if you think you can do a better job, man, get at it. <laughs> so, Dr. Saad, similar accusations have been levied against you, and as you said, you daily receive these horrible types of emails. So if you want to comment on how you defend free speech versus hate speech, offensive speech. So I'm truly a free speech absolutist that short of direct incitement to violence, even the most reprehensible statements, such as I'm glad you mentioned Holocaust and I, I'm a Jewish person who was going to be executed in Lebanon for being Jewish. I support the right of Holocaust deniers to spew their nonsense. You could not be any more clear in your positions and walk the walk and talk the talk 
than having a Jewish person with my personal history supporting the right of Holocaust deniers to be assholes. So if you're going to be in a free society, you have to accept the fact that freedom of speech is not to tell us how beautiful we are or how good looking we are or how smart we are. We are, it's there precisely to protect those who hold reprehensible ideas. Not that we hold such ideas, but that's how much of a free speech absolutist I am. Yeah. And I'm going to start with you, Dr. Amate, on this one. So, the reason you're all here, and I think most of the audience is here, we do agree that there is a free speech crisis on university campuses, and not just in Canada, but now this is a, a wide in North America, in Europe. Uh, I've been researching prior to tonight's lecture, and actually, this is a crisis in Brazil, in Peru, in Chile, in many, many countries now. People are writing in from New Zealand. So how do you explain, how did we reach a point where microaggressions, trigger warnings, and safe space culture has grown so rapidly and become a part of the university structure? Given how much time I took for my last talk, I'll give one word, cowardice. So this one I want to read because I don't want to get the statistic wrong. Um, Greg Lukanoff, who you mentioned, and I enjoyed your interview with him, from the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education report, he and his team discovered 257 incidents of disinviting speakers between 2000 and 2014. And it wasn't just students, the faculty were complicit in this as well. Most of the speakers that were invited and disinvited were conservative, leaning towards the conservative um, political spectrum. And Mr. Lukanov stated, quote, we have come to accept an academic environment in which students crave freedom from speech and from speakers with whom they disagree. We can expand this and, and look at how Ian Hersey Ali was invited and disinvited at Brandeis, Dr. Dr. Margaret Somerville uh, at my alma mater at Ryerson when she came to receive an honor, students stood up and turned their backs. What was her great sin is that she said children do best in um, mom-dad homes and she didn't like the word sperm donor, she wanted it to be called a biological parent. Um, so you see this all the time and my, my question is, I know you said cowardice, but the point is majority of the university professors are people very well read, very well educated, why is this not a concern for them? Do they not feel that they are doing a disservice to their students by not encouraging them to engage in critical analysis and hearing dissenting views? Dr. Peterson? Well, I, I think that there are a handful of disciplines and a relative handful of professors who are full-time professional ideological agitators, and that's what they're paid for. Um, and that's what they claim about themselves. It's not like this is a secret or anything that's being hidden. It's splashed all over the web pages of women's studies, for example. And then I think the rest of the professors are mostly busy doing their research and they have their heads buried in, in their job. You know, it's a, it's a reasonably demanding job. I mean, it's not steam cleaning the slaughterhouse at midnight, you know, which is, I think, the worst job I've ever heard of. But. But it's still a demanding job, and, and I don't know why we also expect that academics would be particularly courageous. I mean, generally speaking, people, especially when they can be individually identified and targeted, aren't particularly courageous. And we'd expect more, perhaps, from intellectuals, but I don't think that we necessarily have any reason to assume, expect more from them. You'd hope that tenure would do it, you know? But I would say that for most, most academics are used to hiding their opinions until they get tenure and then they're so accustomed to hiding their opinions by then they forgot what the hell they were. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just add, Absolutely. just regarding the cowardice, I've often opined on this for any of you who follow me. I can't even get some of my colleagues to like a Facebook post on my personal page. Right? I mean, so imagine how far you must be down the well of I'm not talking about being public the way we are here, up on stage. If you are sufficiently tepid that you don't have the, the fortitude, the conviction to just like something I've, I wrote, 
But I know that you liked it because you'll write to me privately after and say, oh gee, I loved what you wrote. Well, why could you press like? Well, because somebody else might see that I liked what you wrote. Now, what I wrote will not be in the least bit controversial, but the thought police is so uh, fear-inducing that even tenured professors won't engage in the banal act of liking your post. That's how much cowardice can parasitize you. But isn't there, um, so we talked about the fear, but are professors obligated to um, speak the truth? For example, when we talk about science and reason, and people are making claims, uh, like Dr. Peterson, when you were on the show with uh, Steve Pagan on the agenda, um, actually that's one of the things that deeply disturbed me and partially motivated me to do this. How does a University of Toronto professor show up on national television and say there's no such thing as biological sex and science supports him? Surely if he had said the earth is flat, there's no such thing as germ theory or challenge any of those things, he would be openly ridiculed and mocked because professors would say that's a lie, that's not scientifically true, we have evidence of germ theory. But we also have evidence of sex differences. Um, so why are some things they're willing to call out as this is false, not the truth, and other things they're not? Well, I, I think it's hard to overestimate how deep the ideological division that's characteristic of the Western world is at present. I mean, the, the postmodernists in particular, who are essentially Marxist in their origins at least, and in their essential philosophy, because it's a philosophy of oppressor against oppressed, and that that's the explanation yeah. for the world. Their real goal, this is true of Foucault, who was a reprehensible individual by every possible measure, and Derrida, who was a trickster at, at minimum, and, and at, at absolute minimum, their goal was to expose the inadequacies and horror of the Western world at the deepest possible philosophical level and flip it upside down. Mm -hmm. It's not a secret, you just have to read their books. With, with, with Foucault it was fundamentally because he didn't fit in in a variety of different ways. Right. Um, and so his response to the fact that he didn't fit in socially or sexually or <coughs> according to his particular <coughs> subsection of sexual tastes, let's say, and I'm not talking about his homosexuality. Um, he, as far as I can, am concerned, he felt that it was his revenge to show how everyone in the world was wrong <coughs> except him, something like that. And I mean, he had a pretty substantial intellect and, right. and could draw on, I would say, decades of quasi-suicidal resentment to fuel his ideological fire. These ideas, especially in the activist disciplines, they have an absolute control. And they question the very idea of scientific truth. That's just part of the oppressive, European, Eurocentric, phallocentric patriarchy. And the idea that scientific truth is somehow superior to other truths is a form of privilege and marginalization. It's the marginalization of non-scientific views. It's all power for, the, for, for those ideologues. And, you know, they'll, they'll act out their belief in science. They use computers. They fly on airplanes. Uh, they they f follow the laws of gravity when they fall. Um, but they don't accept them ideologically. And it's a no-holds-barred battle. And people don't really understand that. And I've been accused of being a well, many things. It's Hitler was the late, 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 latest one, as I mentioned. Um, but, you know, and I'm blowing this out of proportion, but I know, I understand their writings. And they, the point is to flip everything upside down. And it's happening, so. Dr. Sam? So to, to, answer, to answer your question in a slightly different way. You have to think of progressives in academia as a form of quasi-religious fundamentalists, right? So in the same way that a religious person accepts certain revealed truth, truths, and he or she won't alter those beliefs in light of scientific evidence, the same cognitive trap happens with the progressives in academia. 
they, they, they are not truth tellers. They are there to promulgate their quasi-religion and then to the extent that there is trivially obvious scientific truths that contradict their quasi-religion, then they will reject it as per the show where you know biology yes. is Nazism and so on. So the way you, you really have to look at their mindset is that they are secular religious fundamentalists. They have revealed truths and they won't deviate from them. Well, and Dr. Sapp used a very, he mentioned a very interesting term, which you should all familiarize yourself with. It's, the term is biological essentialism. And that's an outright attack on biology itself, especially on the evolutionary end of the, which is where the activists are going to start taking biology apart because it's the easiest discipline to go after from an ideological position. But biological essentialism to the ideological activists is already in the same camp as Eurocentric patriarchal oppressor, right, or fascist. Those things are, they're, they're, they're part of the same cognitive category. And so when you hear the word biological essentialist, you, you have to now understand that there's no difference between calling someone a biological essentialist, so that would be someone like Gad, or someone like, well, or Orrin for that matter, who believe that, you know, the fact that we're embodied biological individuals is actually an important part of our fundamental being, that that's, that's unacceptable, it's politically unacceptable, it's tantamount to fascism. So that's a very, very um, dire situation. And it's going to get far worse before it gets better. So, so Dr. Amate, so like I was saying earlier, because the safe space culture microaggressions, it has spread at such a speed. Like I, I like I told you, it's in New Zealand and Australia. What role do you see social media playing in this? Like, what are the factors that we can attribute to the speed at which this is spreading? You just described it. I mean, social media provides the ability for people from one part of the world to spread ideas to contaminate people uh, immediately. And we're social animals. So if people have this illusion yeah. that everybody or the right people, this is the nature of identity politics, if they think that the good people, the right people, the righteous people have this belief system, act this way, say this is correct, mm -hmm. people want to be part of that group. Because if you're not in, if you're not in the in group, you're in the out group, and many people that, that's anathema to them. That's it's terrifying to not be part of the you know the, the, the either the good side or the popular side. And this again, this is the nature of identity politics. It is simplified uh, description. Uh, Dr. Sad, you're very active. You and Dr. Peterson on social media. So what role do you see all this Twitter and Facebook and all of this playing in spreading the politically correct? wars and, and culture right across the board? Well, I think it's, it's, it's important for spreading any ideas. I'm always amazed that many of our colleagues, most of our colleagues, have not taken the, uh, the, the advantages of using these tools. Now, I understand that many professors might not have the personality types that would make them sufficiently comfortable and confident to be on social media. But, you know, if I compare the velocity at which I can spread ideas, uh, certainly Dr. Peterson and I, uh, maybe less so Dr. Amate, have been very involved in, this, you know, in scientific publishing. Well, it takes you several years to uh, do a project and make it go through a peer review process that's typically very brutal. Before you publish the damn paper, it's probably taking you four, five, six years. And then if five years down the line, 30, 40, 50 other scientists have cited it, well, you've done a good job. Well, we can get on our social media and share an idea, and within 20 minutes, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 people. And so it's a wonderful vehicle for mimetic propagation. And so both the spread of bad ideas and the spread of good ideas yeah. uh, is a fertile place for them to happen on social media. And this is a question for the three of you, so if the three of you can chime in. Dr. Peterson, why don't you get us started? So the University of Chicago has recently um, announced its very strong commitment to free speech. And along with admission letters, they are sending students, before you sign on the dotted line and accept admission to University of Chicago, you need to understand that this is a university that will not allow safe spaces, trigger warnings, any of the above. And if you are interested in applying to this school, you need to like sign on that and understand that. If not, go elsewhere and stay at home. So my question is, do you think 
this will have a rippling effect in other universities, in Canada maybe? Like, is this where we're headed? That we're going to have to be very clear about what the expectation is when a student attends university in terms of dissenting views or opinions? Two things. The first thing is a bit of a detour. I, I would actually like to say some good things about the University of Toronto in relationship to this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that I mean, they responded to what happened last year in October around what I had done on YouTube by sending me letters under pressure from the people that we've been talking about. But I would say that they did host the debate, which was a good thing, um, even though you could perhaps quibble about the format. I don't think it's worth quibbling about that. Um, and they, they didn't take any action against me. And you could say that that was because I have so much public support. Yeah. But there's not any reason to be particularly cynical about that. I think they came around very quickly. And I think the University of Toronto is tilting hard towards the University of Chicago end of the distribution. So, you know, good for them. I mean, people, it was a complicated situation and people have to learn, right? It takes a while to learn and they didn't know what to do. They were worried about how many chairs were gonna be in the faculty lounge, you know? I'm not being snide about that either. They were concerned with administrative affairs and then all of a sudden this philosophical issue blew up. And so they can't expect people to get it right, right away. I think what's going to happen if we're fortunate is that students and their parents are going to produce the transformation because universities like the University of Missouri I mean, their enrollment has collapsed. And I think what we'll see is that as people become more aware of the, the difference between the universities like the University of Chicago that support free speech and the ones that pursue social justice, like Brown University, for example, which is number one on Jonathan Haidt's list of social justice universities, um, they're, gonna, they're gonna damage their brand. People are gonna walk away. The donors are gonna stop giving. Like, I think, I think in the final analysis of the economics marketplace choice that switches this around. Mm -hmm. yeah, Dr. Sadden and Dr. Amitay. So just to, not to rain on the parade of University of Chicago, uh, I received recently a email from a graduate student at University of Chicago. I've subsequently done a sad truth clip on it, where the student in question shared with me screenshots of a test that they have to do as part of their Title IX uh, training. And the, uh, one of the questions that he shared, he or, he or she, he or she, I'm not gonna say, uh, or, or they, uh, it was, if a woman dresses provocatively, I'm paraphrasing, uh, could she be engaging in sexual signaling? And if you answer yes to that, then, the, then the, the, there's an alert that says, are you sure that that's what you want to answer? So you have to keep answering it until you get the right answer. Your degree is withheld. Your ability to enroll in your courses is, with, is withheld until you pass that training. Now, I, I mentioned that I published a paper with one of my former doctoral students Sad and stems from 2012, where we looked at how women dress as a function of where they are in their menstrual cycle. And we found that, not surprisingly, during the ovulatory phase of their menstrual cycles, they dress as a form of sexual signaling. So therefore, a scientific finding would be construed as wrong thing at the University of Chicago and someone would be held from getting their degree. So I wouldn't be sending medals to the University of Chicago yet. Oh, you, you know what that is, Gab? That's biological essentialism. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Amate, your take on that? Like, is this a direction that universities should be heading or consider heading? That they need to send out this information before students sign on the admission line? I think they have to. And look, I, I don't want to make it overly simplified, but as a parenting expert, I do believe that these types of mindsets, attitudes, strength, whatever, integrity, comes from the home. Mm -hmm. Parents have to be the ones to tell their children from the beginning, you know, how to be, and, and I got in trouble for this because I said, I, I'm raising my three daughters not to be three girls or three women, I'm raising them to be three strong human beings. And I had a student who got offended by that, okay? So as a parent, we don't have that many, uh, 
um, ex expectations, but one of them is to raise fully functioning children into teens and then adults. And I think it starts at home, and parents, they can't be complacent. Look, social media has eclipsed any parents' wildest fantasies. Parents have to step back, they have to look at what's actually going on. Because when I talk about Dr. Peterson, I raise Dr. Peterson's name, and depending on where, the, what the context is, some people know him right away, others don't know him, okay? So what we're talking about here, it's, it's just, it's, it's, no one, some people don't know about it at all. Parents need to know that this is not hysteria, this is not hyperbole, this is a real problem going on, and they have to start inculcating the sense of, you know, the critical thinking and not being beaten down uh, into a pre a submission by these, uh, these oppressive forces at the university. Dr. Peterson. Well, I, I've been trying to figure out. I've been trying to figure out, you know, there are markers for unacceptable activity on the right, right? So claims of racial supremacy, for example, we've, we've all decided, except for a tiny minority, that such claims are, no, are not acceptable, right? That if you have any sense, you distance yourself, if you're on the right, from people who make those claims, like Ben Shapiro did, for example, after uh, Charlottesville. It's not so easy to do the same with the radical left, but I've got some hints for parents. If you're, you tell your children, if your teachers are talking about, if their teachers are talking about diversity, equity, and inclusivity, and especially if they measure, mention white privilege, that it's time for your child to stand up and leave the class. Now, As far, now, that isn't, those, those four words aren't a perfect marker, although I think even the first three, equity, diversity, and inclusivity, are sufficient to, to mark the ideological philosophy that's driving the hypothetically educational experience. But I don't believe that the educators have any right to, to be toying with junior high kids and, and high school kids in that manner. And if you support your kids in their decision to walk out and walk them through it and, and let them know this is not something to be taken lightly. This isn't a way of getting out of class. This isn't an excuse for skipping school. This is a very, very important moral exercise in the rejection of ideological inculcation. That that is also something that that I think would strike a very real blow at the heart of this, I don't know what you would call it, um, it's an epidemic of indoctrination, something like that. I just want to add one thing. <laughs> one of the audience members um, sent me a document. He's, they are going to a teacher's college, uh, I believe, and I'll get it wrong. And social justice is spread throughout the curriculum. They're teaching. And one of the things is there's a component in phys ed, social justice in is that that's what they're teaching. No way. It just baffles my mind. And he showed it to me, like I could not believe it. It's so. like the feminist glacial studies uh, paper. I don't know if you heard about that. Christina Hoff Summers was mocking that. Like, you're going to study about glaciers through a feminist perspective? I, actually, I showed that in our talk, yes. Yeah. I, I actually, about, I can't remember how many months ago, I put up a satirical piece where I introduced a new, a new field called social justice mathematics. <laughs> um, and I actually went through a whole bunch of examples of irrational numbers, marginalizes mental health, <laughs> and so on. And about eight months later, I often joke that my satire proves prophetic. Well, I appeared on a show, a Russian television, you know, Russian RT, whatever it's called, where I was asked to weigh in on a professor in the United States who argued that math is white supremacy. <laughs> and she wasn't being satirical, she wasn't joking, she wasn't being facetious, and so I was asked to come in and weigh in on this. It's simply hallucinatory what is going on. You know, you mentioned that, and Dr. Peterson, you mentioned white privilege, and one of the things that really has concerned me quite a bit as um, a student of philosophy and history is this concerted effort now I know Columbia University is doing this, where they want to remove Shakespeare and Chaucer and other writers because they said it's triggering students. 
and we need to have more diversity and anti-colonial perspective. Um, these are the greatest thinkers in world history, the greatest artists, the greatest philosophers. I've had colleagues get upset at me, to my face and tell me, when during my break I read Socrates or something, that that's offensive, that he didn't believe women had the right to vote, he never stood up for the rights of the slaves, um, they didn't want to go to a museum, they didn't want to go to art exhibits, they said they were triggered. So, no, nobody has achieved so much advancement as Western civilization. Nobody can deny this, it is a fact, in science, arts, literature, or math. Humanity has benefited from this, every single culture and country. Yet, when this is brought up in classrooms, like students have just approached me in the break, saying they're targeted just for their race of being white. And if you are a white man, straight, cis, you are the number one target in, in humanities and liberal colleges across the board. Yet, everyone is using their inventions, like every single nation and professor. So, thoughts on that? Well, I, I just think it's another manifestation of exactly the same thing. I mean, the, these ideologies, I, I've described it as, and not only me, obviously, as postmodern neo-Marxism, they're, they're, they're answer-generating heuristics this is something Solzhenitsyn detailed extraordinarily well in the Gulag Archipelago about, you know, if you're possessed by an ideology, you learn about ten rules, and then you can just crank the crank, and the rules will produce speech acts, right? They'll produce words, and once you accept the fact that everything that you don't like about life is a consequence of the patriarchy, and you add Eurocentric and fellowcentric to that, maybe toss in a bit of race, then you have an answer for every question. And you know, it's a very fragile system in some sense. You know, we talked about people being triggered. That that ideology is so full of performative contradictions that it's very fragile. Performative contradiction occurs when you act out something that runs contrary to your stated beliefs. So for for example, you might claim that mathematics is a tool of white supremacy, but use your iPad. That's a performative contradiction because one of those things doesn't go with the other. And that's an indication of the fragility of your belief system. And so when your beliefs, one of the things your belief systems do is regulate your emotions. They, they do a lot more than that, but they definitely regulate your emotions. And so the people who are putting forth these ideologies really are fragile in their cognitive structures. And, they really do respond very badly to having their axioms challenged, as do many people, by the way. But, but, but it, it's part and parcel of the same thing. It's all generated by the same limited set of axioms. But is this group so large in numbers that they can have this level of influence where they want to remove Shakespeare and Blake and Milton and... They, they don't have to have numbers. They just have to be noisy. Like, really, like... The views that most of you share are undoubtedly the views of the vast majority of people in the Western world, you know, if, essentially. But a tiny, noisy minority that's well-funded and well-organized, and, and the, the radical leftists on the college campuses qualify on both counts, they're subsidized. This is one of the amazing things, is they're subsidized by taxpayers and by the people who pay tuition for their kids. They do, they do nothing but organize and agitate and train new organizers and agitators. Those of you who own businesses, you better beware of your human resources people because that's the pathway by which all of these pathological ideas are moving into the corporate sphere. And if you think that the HR people who are pushing diversity, equity, and inclusivity on you are pro-capitalist, you've got another thing coming. And so I have absolutely no idea why you would encourage the invasion of a fifth column into your enterprise. I guess it's to, you know, trumpet your social justice, um, what would you call it, qualifications, but it's an extraordinarily bad medium to long-term decision. So it's a noisy minority, but don't underestimate the power of a well-organized noisy minority, especially when 
they can target individuals and shut them down because then the individuals never get to discover that, hey, well, we're actually in the majority here. Like the over, I would say it's probably 20 to one. It might even be 50 to one. Right. So, but it, it just doesn't take that much. I think the way I would analogize the s small number, the noisy minority, is think about terrorists. They constitute a very small number of all living human beings. Yet most of us will waste a substantial amount of our lives going through security protocols at airports because of that small, noisy minority. And so in the same way that terrorists are attacking our sense of safety, but they constitute a small minority, these progressive types, I've referred to them, someone said, oh, but that's, that's a mean term, they were offended. They are intellectual terrorists, right? Instead of making us fearful when we get on a flight, if this is going to be our last flight, they make us fearful to walk into a classroom and speak our mind, lest the thought police. And so, so no, they're not a small minority. It takes very few people to terrorize many of us, and so they're doing a very good job. And, and Dr. Saad said intellectual terrorists, and you think, yeah, it's kind of, that's a bit hard on the rhetoric, let's say. But that's, that's not right, it's not harsh rhetoric at all. I was reading this chapter yesterday by a guy named Mark Lilla, who wrote a recent book. Um, the name will come to me in a moment. But there was a chapter uh, on Foucault in there, and I hadn't re remembered Foucault for a while. I read a bunch of his books when, like 20 years ago. And uh, he had a quote in there, Lilla, um, from, from Foucault in the late 60s, if I remember correctly. And he, he basically said, if the, and I'm paraphrasing, but if the oppressed overthrew the oppressors, he might have used bourgeoisie and, uh, or proletariat and bourgeoisie at that point in his writing, but it doesn't matter. It's the, if the oppressed overthrew the oppressor and the consequence of that was the mass death, painful death of the oppressors, then that would be a perfectly acceptable price to pay. Now, I don't know how you could write that in the late 60s. I don't know how you could be that blind and, 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 and malevolent. Like everyone knew by the 1960s who had their eyes open the least amount. They knew what had happened in the Soviet Union. Malcolm Muggeridge told the West in the 1920s, George Orwell, who was a socialist, informed everybody in the 1960s that knew that that system was pathological beyond belief, and yet Foucault, who's the darling of the left, the radical left, could come out and say, well, you know, it's just a few corpses, like, and they won't, they won't be mine. They won't be my corpse, which is really the critical thing. So that's a small, you can't make an omelet, you know, without breaking a few eggs, right? So to call them intellectual terrorists, to call Derrida an intellectual terrorist, terrorist to call Foucault an intellectual terrorist is exactly right. They, they hated each other, by the way, which is quite interesting. But their, their thinking tangles together very nicely. They wanted to flip everything upside down. So, Dr. Okay. When I hear this, the one thing I keep going back to as a part of the, you know, the, the impetus for my speech was this idea of personal accountability. Mm -hmm. And everything that's going on here, it robs people of this personal accountability. Mm -hmm. And we, earlier we asked, what can we do about this? Parents from a young age, from the child's young age, have to instill in them the sense of a personal accountability and b not be afraid to make mistakes, to take risks, to fail, and then get up and you know and learn from that. And I'm seeing again as a parenting, actor, I'm seeing way too many parents kind of abdicating that responsibility because they're too busy d double careers or you know putting whatever the case may be, but they're not investing the time in helping the children have that strong sense of, again, personal responsibility or accountability. There has to be a consequence to your actions. And you can't just say, well, if I screwed up, it's because of the patriarchy. You have to say, I didn't do my job right. But Dr. Amate, even if parents do everything they can, what about when the children are in school? Because like I was saying, my, the most frantic emails I'm getting, like frantic, are teachers. So they feel very powerless. Mm -hmm. So the kids are, going to be spending six to seven hours a day in a classroom and they are being in, in, indoctrinated for lack of a better word. So when they do go home, the parents might be giving them all that, but then on Twitter and Facebook, in the classroom, in the textbooks now, <coughs> that Kathleen Wynne had mentioned she wants to remove the word mother and father. 
and replace it with primary caregiver or parent. Because mother and father is not inclusive, never mind the fact that all humans are born through mother and father, and we've been using this More word. More than biological essentialism. Yeah. <laughs> and the fact that, you know, billions of people on this planet say mother and father, billions, and this is something that she's saying needs to be eradicated in schools. So I want to get uh, Dr. Amate first you to comment on that, since you brought up the parenting issue, and then Dr. Peterson and Dr. Sad as well. Yeah, well, as hard as it is, these parents have to stand up, as Dr. Peterson was saying. If the children are being taught something, how do the parents know that? They have to be more involved. They've got to get involved with what the curriculum happens to be. Meet the teacher. Ask the right questions. You can't let this go unchecked. And I know, because I've counseled a lot of uh, parents in similar situations, if they push back really hard, you know, and, and they make their voice known, teachers will back down a little bit, uh, because they don't want a problem-headed parent. Uh, so it's really up to the parents to do that, A, with the school staff, and B, with their children. No matter how much, the parents have to put these children, they have to put a, an asbestos suit on these children so that they're not, uh, you know, poisoned or to, uh, by, by these toxic ideas. Right. It, it's, it's the parents' job. That, it starts with them. Dr. Pierce? Well, this is not subtle either. Like, in Ontario, well, we have social justice tribunals, right, which is a phrase that should send a chill down anyone's heart. Um, and the reason I'm using that example is because the social justice types have become so brazen, I would say, that they don't even hide their terminology anymore. It's like social justice tribunals. They're quasi-court systems, and beware if you ever get tangled up in one. Um, but the same thing's happening with the elementary school curriculum. It's being transformed into a social justice curriculum. It's a lot easier to teach that tripe than it is to actually educate people, because you only have to teach them ten things, and then, then they can repeat them, you know, and you've done your job, and, and you're morally virtuous. It's way more difficult to teach kids how to read or, or do mathematics. But, you know, we're at a point in Canada, weirdly enough, where the philosophical stability that we've taken for granted that has made this country such a stable and welcoming place is really under assault. And Wynne's a good example. Hypothetic, she, hypothetically, she leads the centrist liberals. The liberals are always occupying the center in Canadian history, right? They move a little left, and then they move a little right. And you could be cynical about that, but you shouldn't be, because they're tracking the population. But now, like my estimation is, is that Wynne is far left of the Democratic Socialist Party I knew as the NDP back in the 1970s but she's operating under the rubric of the liberals, and no one's, no one. I mean, she's not popular, right? I think she's at 10%. And, and she should resign if she had an ounce of impunity. Right. In, in a parliamentary system, when, when your popularity goes down to 20%, you resign, that's what you do. But, the parliamentary system is just part of the evil patriarchy anyway, so you don't have to... Yeah, well, I'm serious about that. It's perfect justification. Why should you pay any attention to the evil patriarchy? So, but the fact of the matter is, is that the educational faculties are producing ideologues who are indoctrinating children as young as possible into the cause of social justice. That's what's happening. And if... If you don't believe it, then just go look online. Go look at the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario. Just go look at their website. It's not like they're hiding it. Most of the time, people don't hide what they're doing. They just tell you, and you think, no, they're not doing that. It's like, yeah, they are. That's why they're telling you that, is they're actually doing it. So, Surprise. If I could just set up um, a, a theory and then see how we could apply it to what you would all do. So some of you may or may not have heard of this uh, collective goods uh, dilemma called the tragedy of the commons. It was sort of repopularized by an ecologist by the name of Hardy. And so let me just kind of uh, explain it very briefly and then link it to the problem that we're facing. So the tragedy of the commons, let's say you have 10 farmers, uh, each of whom has some livestock that he, he uses uh, they, they graze on a common land. Now the land needs to rest for a year or two years so that it can recover. So they come to a gentleman's agreement where they say, okay, we each promise that we will not let our livestock 
go on this land. But what they end up doing is each says, how about if I violate the tenant, hoping that all of the other folks will be honorable and not violated. Well, that's the perfect uh, situation. I can still have my livestock feed, and the other ones are all honorable, and therefore the land will recover. The tragedy of the commons is that they all think that, and therefore it doesn't get resolved. Now, how do we link that to the social justice warrior problem that we're talking about? Well, everybody, not everybody in this room, but most people think, well, let Peterson and let Sad do the honorable thing. I'm busy, I need to buy my tomatoes for tonight's dinner. I've got my daughter's graduating ceremony tomorrow. I've got the busy exam. There are other folks who will be honorable and do the right thing, where while I can renege on my responsibility. And so what I implore each of you to do is to not fall prey to the tragedy of the commons. You all have a word that can be used. And if everybody stands up in unison and fights these very bad ideas, then they could be a little bleep in our rear view mirror. But if we keep expecting a few people to carry all of the burden, then we could potentially lose the battle. Mm -hmm. I just want to expand on that a little bit. One of the things that people do when they write me is to say that watching my videos have provided them with the words that they need to express certain ideas. You know, ideas are kind of strange because they often begin with embodied sensations, emotions. You know, you come home after work, you're annoyed. Maybe you have a fight with your partner, your wife or your husband, to use the biological essentialist <laughs> terms. <laughs> and, you know, the fight goes kind of sideways and it isn't until you're 20 minutes into it that you really realize what was annoying you. Maybe it was something at work. So, the idea is first manifested as a as an unpleasant emotion. You don't even know what the damn idea is, and then you kind of have to stumble around stupidly while you're torturing your spouse, <laughs> trying to figure out what the hell's wrong with you. You know, um, the point I'm making here is that it's not easy to engage in abstract philosophical arguments, and you're, if you're up against the postmodernist ideologues, they'll outword you pretty damn rapidly unless you have thought these things through to a great degree. But you don't have to, you know. You, you, can, you can, it's good to use precise language, but you can say, look, there's something about what's happening here that really strikes me the wrong way. I don't know what it is, but I oppose it. And if you're pushed, you know, if you're pushed, you can say, well, look, I don't have the language to lay out my counter argument at the moment, but it's violating my sense of my sense of right and wrong, something like that. And at least then you've signaled, I don't, I'm not saying that's good enough, those are just feelings. They aren't good enough, but they're better than nothing. And at least then you can signal the fact that you're not operating in full compliance with the agenda. And you know, there's a famous experiment by a guy named Solomon Ash. He showed people two lines on the blackboard, one of which was obviously slightly longer than the other, but obviously, so that everyone could tell. And then he had all the confederates in the class, so the audience, pretend that they were the same size, and there were, you know, a few experimental subjects sprinkled in there who didn't know that the whole audience had been set up, and so he would ask people whether the lines were the same or different, and they would say that they were the same, and then he would go to the people who were not in on the secret and asked them, and they would almost invariably say that they were the same. Um, but if one person said that they were different, then all of them would say that they were different. So that's all it takes. It takes one person to sort of stand, stand up and say, even in an awkward manner, look, I, I, I'm not happy with what's going on here. And then other people, who there's more than you that think that way. It's almost always the case, you know, unless there's something spectacularly peculiar about you. I mean, there probably is. You know? <laughs> so, but don't, don't assume that you have to be perfect at this before you do it, because you have to stumble around like an idiot when you're engaged in these sorts of s struggles, let's say. Because it's difficult and complicated, and you're not going to get good at it 
unless you practice. And when you first start, you're going to be bad. It's going to be embarrassing. You know, you're going to say things that aren't even correct while you stumble around. But it's part of sharpening yourself up, and it's absolutely and it's really useful. It's really useful to sharpen yourself up like that. So you can have some reliance on your own sense of propriety, especially if you discuss it with a couple of people around you too. You know, because that helps kind of keep you in check. Your 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 brother, your sister, your kids, your your husband or wife. You can prepare that way, but don't be thinking that you have to be a genius to do this because. Well, if that's the case, then we're in real trouble. So I'm going to interject here and say that we've reached the last question, and then we'll have the question answered. And so the last question is a, is a bit of a two-part. One is, I know, Dr. Peterson, you mentioned that the fact that so many people are here, I mean, the underlying reason is not something we should feel good about. But does this give you hope, seeing uh, the demand for this, and 1,500 people sold out, um, that people are very concerned about this issue, um, they want to hear a dialogue around it. They want to hear solutions around it. Uh, is there a reason for us to be hopeful tonight, given the large turnout? Mm -hmm. And this is a question for the three of you. Well, I, I think we're in a true transition period. Mm -hmm. um, I think that things could go spectacularly badly or spectacularly well. It's a lot easier for things to go spectacularly badly. I'm neither optimistic nor pessimistic, I would say, because I really don't believe, I believe that things are so uncertain that looking into the future to any, with any degree of length is not useful. I'm, I'm, and maybe this is just a consequence of my own personal situation, but I've been really playing it day by day. Sometimes I'm hopeful Sometimes I'm less hopeful, but regardless, I think that the, I think, I believe that the truth prevails. And the reason I believe that is because the truth is related to reality. That's what makes it the truth. And reality prevails. And so I'm hopeful in that sense. The question is whether or not people will allow themselves to align with their own truth to the degree that makes the, their adaptation to reality possible. We'll see. It's a decision that everybody's making all the time. Mm -hmm. well, first, I take issue with the you know, use of the word truth. And then we can have a three-hour you know, discussion with you on that. But look, the, the point of my three-hour talk was well, really came down to what can each and every person do to help lean toward the side of an, a, a positive outcome. And Dr. I agree with what Dr. Peterson saying: go one way or the other. Hoping that like coming here and showing support is great, but it's doing the small things, uh, you know, the daily things that just can kind of encourage somebody else to do a little bit more, encourage somebody else to do a little bit more. So as long as you're acting in that manner then we have a chance. And this is, to me, this is a great sign. I'm really glad that there's so many people here. And I just hope that every single person goes out there inspired to try to make at least a little bit of change. Then we have hope. Okay. Dr. Satter, are you hopeful? Uh, I am, if each person in the room commits to, I, I don't know what the metric should be, but commit to getting engaged in some meaningful way X number of times over the next Y period, right? I mean, one, one of the ways that we affect change is not to say, uh, you know, I'd like to lose weight next year, but rather to say, uh, if I go on a all-inclusive vacation, I will never have more than one plate at the buffet, right? <laughs> so the details matter about being able to, and being able to implement something. Vagueness is the enemy of achieving the, the goal. So what I would implore you to do is, well, first I would say thank you for all coming here because it certainly yeah. uh, gives us great solace to know that there are many people who support the cause, so thank you for that. But I would say that that's insufficient. Mm -hmm. The next step is for each of you to commit in a very concrete way to doing one, two, three actions a week, a month, a day to support the cause, and then we will reverse the tr this trend and we will win the battle like that. I can, I can tell you one thing you can do. And you could write to Andrew Shear and tell him not to be afraid of being conservative. Because you know, 
you can you can do the same to Patrick Brown. And I don't care if you support the Conservatives or not. That's not the point. I know for a fact that they're terrified of being Conservatives. They won't speak up. And the reason for that is, well, they're worried about being singled out and targeted one by one as bigots and transphobes. You know the whole language. They're worried about they're really worried about that. And so as far as I'm concerned, they're basically defeated before they get off the ground because they've lost, if that's the case. But I don't care if you think that the conservatives are, are wrong. That's not the point. We need the distribution of viewpoints and we need a healthy dialogue between them. It's absolutely necessary. If the conservatives are now afraid of being conservative, then we've lost one of our oars and we're going to you know, row around in circles to use a rather trite metaphor, but I'm telling you, I've talked to lots of them, and they're so afraid that they won't have me come and speak to them, generally speaking, not in public, because they're afraid of being associated with me. And, you know, well, Gad said the same thing about his colleagues, I mean, so that means despite the fact that they agree with me, right, most of them, proportion of them. They're, they're worried about being an, a, associated with me in the public eye. And the reason that they're worried about that is because they are afraid. And that's a bad thing. I don't ever remember that being the case in the Canada that I have known since I was a tiny child. It's a bad thing. So. Um, you know, I have a very good friend here tonight, and I'm not going to name her, but because she's still in the field of social work, and she's in a very uh, prominent position, and even though I'd love to thank her, and she's helped me a lot today, I worry just saying her name and her being associated with me when she goes back to work on Monday, what that would mean for her, so I'm not even going to look in her direction and say her name. So that's, that's very sad, and I said this was a two-part question, so my other second part of this, and this is the final question, what um, person right now in modern times can you think of that you really admire who is standing up for free speech other than yourself and the co-panelists? <laughs> what other name can you put out there um, so that the audience, if they want to read up on them, read their books or look up their YouTube videos, they can? So if each of you could give uh, a name. I'd like to give one, Ben Shapiro. <laughs> And I can't say your name, although you, you're all in there, because I, I said it can't be anyone here. I'm pretty impressed with Jonathan Haidt. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Sack? Rather than listing someone famous whose name you would all know, here's who I'm going to thank. It's going to be a collective sort of shout out. All the people who currently live in non-free societies, who truly know what it is, to live under totalitarian ideologies. Yes. And like the place I come from, who dare speak out, and I've had some of those people on my show. I recently had a Jordanian guy who uh, was catapulted to fame out of nowhere because he uh, started the atheist organization in Jordan. Well, that's what takes courage is to be able to take these positions, not at Brown University in Castrato land, but it's, it's to be able to speak openly and defend your convictions in lands where doing so will cause you to be, have your head detached from the rest of your body. And so my admiration goes to all the people in these uh, non-free societies who are in the front line of fighting for freedom. strike against me first because you took Ben Shapiro yeah, I and that. second because my answer now is juxtaposed against Gad it's going to sound really bad uh, <laughs> but it's going to sound strange but you know what someone that I think has been very influential in spreading ideas and getting people to talk and, and you know getting ignoring left and right and this and that Joe Rogan so I as a some of you may know, I, Joe is a good friend of mine and I've been on this show many, many times. And I'm absolutely amazed at the influence that this guy has. I, there isn't a place I can walk 
where someone won't come up to me and say, oh, I loved your Joe Rogan show XYZ. This guy has more influence than probably CNN, NBC, NBC and CBS put together. And by the way, that speaks to a point that we've all discussed. He came out of nowhere, right? He's a, he's a stand-up comic, he's an actor, but he's an open person. He's a person who just likes to sit down and discuss ideas. And through that conviction and through that intellectual curiosity, he's built a platform that is simply remarkable. And so hats off to Joe Rogan. Yeah. Joe gets 120 million downloads a month. 1.5 billion a year. Wow. Right, so he's probably the most powerful interviewer who's ever lived. Wow. So, yeah, it's really something. I asked him about that. He said he tries not to think about it. <laughs> so, I think we're going to move to the... Sorry? Yeah, some people are pretty happy about Camille Pelli as well. Yeah. So.